I was a little curious about it myself, but uh, I only had to hear the songs to know that Alan J. Lerner had really done Shaw justice. I believe to this day that the songs just took off where the text of the play finished. And um, he was a giant, both Lerner and Lowe, and particularly Moss Hart, who was the director of My Fair Lady. Uh, they were giants, and I was lucky enough to be led by gentle giants in every respect in those days. I sang for Lerner and Lowe first, and uh, belted out my, my audition song and a couple of others, and then went in to start reading from the original Pygmalion, because the script wasn't quite finished. And I knew that I was hopelessly out of my depth. Um, I, you have to remember, I was raised in vaudeville. I wasn't even on the right side of the tracks. I wasn't in legit theater at all. I had never done a play. Um, it, other than this very, very light piece called The Boyfriend. And um, uh, so I really knew from nothing. And uh, I knew that I understood Eliza in some way, but I was hugely shy, hugely insecure. And I wondered if anybody would know that there was something inside that, that they could use if they knew how to get it out for me. There I was singing something like, if memory serves, it was something like the waltz song from Tom Jones or something, with an excruciatingly high big note, which I belted out as loudly as I could and a lot of coloratura. But uh, I guess they figured I had the voice for it. Now, if only I could act, you know. And that's what Moss gave me. Rex, I think they were much more sure about. But he couldn't sing, but he had an innate musicality which enabled him to kind of do a sing-speak uh, sound, which is which was great and exactly right because it blended straight out of dialogue into music, um, into song. I was absolutely atrocious at all the early readings, and poor Rex Harrison wondered what on earth he'd been landed with, this young girl that could sing and had not a clue how to um, get into the arc of a character. Or, I mean, I had no idea how to develop a character at all. And uh, uh, he intimidated me tremendously because he was so... So good. He was also very, very nervous and very, very um, demanding and selfish because he was scared to death because he'd never sung before. So I knew I could pull off all the singing stuff and he for sure knew he could pull off all the dialogue. And, and, uh, uh, but he wasn't about to give anybody else any time. And I know that Stanley Holloway, who played Doolittle, uh, also had problems and was waiting for his sort of um, fleshing out of the character. And Moss took me for a long weekend and dismissed the entire company and worked with me in the most brilliant way. I think that probably Moss, of all people, I read Moss's wonderful biography, Act One. And if you read that, you have to say what a generous, sweet man he was. He came from extremely humble beginnings himself. And I think any other producer would have sent me home. I, I, I had a feeling that if I didn't cut it that weekend, that I probably would have been on a plane back to London. Um, but Moss was a very kind man and uh, covered it by wit and... and uh, sophistication and, and all of the things that he'd acquired, but basically I think he must have sensed and, and identified with my early pain and fear because he'd had it too. And um, he was kind. It's, it's as simple as that. He wanted to, and maybe he was perceptive enough to see, I mean, maybe I didn't know that, that there was something that they felt was there. Um, I certainly didn't, but he certainly seemed to feel that it was there. Lovely man, and I credit him with all that I am today because had it not been for Moss, I probably would have gone back to England. Moss Hart really just got, uh, helped me find Eliza. Um, he, he demonstrated, he uh, said, no, 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 you're acting like a schoolgirl, or uh, that's better, that's better. You know, um, it, it's hard to, Hard to say what he did. It's just that he, he, he created pictures in my head for me. He, um, 
He helped me understand some of Eliza's dilemma. And um, it was, I don't know which was the hardest part, the first half or the second half, because they were both very hard. I don't know whether, the, I, and I was struggling with the Cockney accent, which I, and I'm not great at accents, believe it or not. Um, even though I have a good ear for, for things, I don't have a great ear for accents. Um, but so I was struggling with that too. He just helped me see what courage this young lady had, uh, Eliza Doolittle, that is. We rehearsed on the roof of the new Amsterdam theater, which in those days uh, was the scruffiest, dirtiest place, but had been the great nightclub. And that's where all the Ziegfeld Follies had, had started in those days. And there was this great nightclub above that had gone into terrible um, um, disrepair. And anyway, no, I knew going down to this uh, New Amsterdam that I was in for an awful time. It was a little bit like going to the dentist. You knew it was going to be very painful, but you, if you could stick it out, maybe with luck, you'd come out feeling a heck of a lot better. And that's what Moss did for me. It was painful. And he said, we have no time for embarrassment. We have no time for um, anything but the blunt truth. And he shaped, pushed, cajoled, wheedled, loved me, yelled at me, uh, just helped me become Eliza Doolittle. And although by the following Monday, I'm sure I retreated 50%, I had gained 50%. And uh, it gave me the foundation from which to really start working on the role. And I played My Fair Lady for three and a half years. And Alan Lerner once said that he felt that a long run in a very good role was more help to a performer than doing repertory with lots and lots of short roles. You might become very facile, but what I did was learn what did get a laugh, what didn't get a laugh, and why I didn't get it, if I didn't get it, what the difference was uh, in terms of um, it raining outside or snowing or an audience that was coughing their hearts out or one that was too hot in the uh, seasons when your leading man has a headache or when you have a voice that's hanging on by a thread. I think I learned in My Fair Lady everything that set me up in later years uh, in good stead because um, I really learned how to preserve and take care of myself and I was learning on my feet every single performance. Again, the good fortune in my life uh, suddenly uh, came along and um, after My Fair Lady, uh, I was very lucky to do Camelot for Lerner and Lowe with the wondrous Richard Burton. And uh, <clears throat> by now I was married to Tony. And uh, I did know my way around Broadway and a lit I knew a little bit more about performing. And uh, everybody trusted me and I wasn't quite so desperately shy. And um, the, uh, My Fair Lady was bought for, by uh, uh, Jack Warner uh, to be made into a movie. I didn't think I'd get it. Uh, Alan and Moss, Alan J. Lerner and Moss Hart, I believe hoped that I would. Rex certainly was going to make it. But I understood very well when they cast Audrey Hepburn in the role because although by then I was a fairly big name in, a, in the small pond that is Broadway, I certainly wasn't known across America and I certainly had never made a movie. So um, I didn't get the role of uh, My Fair Lady in the uh, film and lo and behold, uh, I was in Camelot, and uh, Walt Disney came to see Camelot. He was advised to see it because he was putting together this movie of Mary Poppins. He came backstage afterwards. I thought he was just going to visit. And he said, um, would I like to come to Broadway? To, um, uh, sorry, to Hollywood. I was on Broadway. Would I like to come to Hollywood to uh, um, see the drawings, the d designs, the art, the uh, hear the songs and the lyrics for this musical of, of a English book, Mary Poppins, that he was doing. And he turned to Tony Walton and said, and what do you do, young man? And Tony was a, uh, and is a designer of theater and film, a wonderful designer, sets and costumes. But he'd done very, very little at that time. 
And he explained this to Walt, and Walt, Walt said, well, then you'd better bring your portfolio with you when you both come. Oh, and I was just a teeny bit pregnant, like about two to three months pregnant. And I said, but I'm going to have a baby, Mr. Disney. He said, it's okay, we'll wait. <laughs> and uh, so Tony and I uh, went to um, Hollywood, and Walt showed us everything to do with Mary Poppins and also uh, wined and dined us so sumptuously and so wonderfully. And it was such an easy thing to do to say, yes, thank you, Mr. Disney. I would love to do that movie because everything seemed to come full circle because all the stuff in um, Poppins had that rum-ti-tum quality of being vaudeville. And all of a sudden I thought, right, I can... Uh, I, I, I'm home because this I can embrace and perhaps bring something to. And um, again, in the kindest hands possible, um, I was taught how to make a movie. And that was the beginning of that. How lucky can anybody get losing out on My Fair Lady and three months later being asked to do Mary Poppins? I honestly didn't think I would. Uh, I really thought Anne Bancroft was going to get it that year for The Pumpkin Eater. She was superb in the movie. And uh, uh, it, Poppins was my first film. I never dreamed I would get it. And um, uh, actually, when I did get that Oscar, I really felt that it was more because I'd missed out on uh, My Fair Lady, that Hollywood was A, saying welcome, and B, saying how sorry they were that I didn't get it. <clears throat> and in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, that attitude was reflected in the speech that I gave because I said, um, I always knew Americans were generous, but this is absolutely ridiculous. And uh, I really felt that it was generosity and they're saying, welcome, welcome. When I was first asked if I would like to do Sound of Music, um, I was very thrilled to be asked and very glad that I was going to do the movie, but was a little careful about um, certain aspects of it because, because it's, it was tremendously saccharine, on Broadway particularly. And um, I, it, it seemed to me that if we weren't careful with, with the real scenery and with uh, um, uh, everything else that was going to it, it could be horribly sugary. And I certainly made every effort to take some of, to make it more astringent. And the great Christopher Plummer contributed so much in that respect. It was his performance that was the glue, the, the, the vinegar that, that held the film together. And then Robert Wise, who was again an adorable man, our director, and he um, taught me a great deal about filmmaking because um, Mary Poppins was the first film I ever made, and then I made one called um, The Americanization of Emily. But by the time I got to uh, Sound of Music, I was probably getting full of a lot of little tricks and things that I didn't know I was doing. And Bob said, don't do that, don't do that, do that. And um, I really learned a little bit more about filmmaking. Walton on Thames, Surrey, which is where I was born, uh, is about 20 miles south-southwest of London. And when I was very young, it was just a country stop on the railway line. And it is now part of Greater London and very much suburbia. And uh, I know the, the ins and outs of it, but uh, uh, there are very few places that you recognize in terms of the way it used to be. Uh, but it's a... It's a very sweet place. It's, it's sort of the middle village between a very upmarket village and a very uh, low uh, poverty village, at least in the early days. My real father was a teacher, a school teacher, and he taught practical crafts and English and um, math. But my stepfather, uh, my mother married, remarried when I was about four or five years old. So I then went to live with my mother and my stepfather. And he was a fine tenor. He had a, a singing voice. Um, he was from Canada, from Toronto. Uh, he uh, joined 
forces in more ways than one with my mother in that she was a really wonderful pianist and um, uh, probably should have been a performing concert pianist. But in fact, due to circumstances and the war and, and tremendous poverty and things like that, they uh, became part of a vaudeville act. And uh, consequently, I knew nothing else but that. And to their amazement, I think, they discovered at a, when I was about eight years old, my stepfather, I think in an attempt to become a little closer to me, uh, decided to give me some singing lessons because my school had closed down because of the escalation of the war. And uh, um, I thought he, I think he thought it might just sort of keep me quiet, so to speak. And they discovered that I had this four octave soprano voice, which surprised them since it was my stepfather who sang, not my, my, not my real dad at all. Um, and so I knew nothing but vaudeville music hall gradually began to appear with my mum and my stepdad and tour the halls and made a fairly important for me debut when I was about 12 years old. It was a, a sophisticated London review and it was at a theater which is no longer there. It was called the London Hippodrome and it's now just a sort of a nightclub in Leicester Square, London. But it was a very beautiful theater and um, I was literally the smallest person on the bill. And because it was so sophisticated, the producers thought perhaps uh, it wasn't right that I would be singing in this show. And the night before we opened, they decided that they couldn't use me. And of course, <laughs> my mum, being somewhat of a, a stage mum, sort of said, no, you can't do this to this child. It's her great debut and so on. So she and my stepfather and, and their agent descended on the poor producer. And they said, she'll sing a much more difficult song, and uh, you'll see. And so I auditioned for a much more difficult song. And the end result was that I was in the show, stayed in the show. And on opening night, the audience went crazy. And um, it was a complete standing ovation. First thing I'd ever really done, first time I'd ever really um, uh, tried anything that important. And um, the press followed me home, you know, the kind of thing when you're a young fluke in a way. And um, that was the beginning of a, of a very busy few years right through my teens of touring and radio and early, early television and so on. The name of the show at the uh, London Hippodrome was called Starlight Roof. And um, it starred English perform uh, 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 Vic Oliver, Fred Emney, Pat Kirkwood, all very talented um, uh, uh, Patricia Kirk was a very glorious looking lady with wonderful long legs and she was the sort of, uh, she was the leading lady in every sense. I have retained some very close friends <clears throat> from my home village, but actually uh, I didn't have many peers, uh, not um, young friends in those days. It was all mostly adults because of the touring, because of the vaudeville. But the kind of education I was getting was that strange uh, one of standing in the wings and watching phenomenal performers uh, performing every week, every night. Um, and they, I mean, watching everything from comedians to jugglers to animal acts to, and different kinds of comedians and dancers. And um, uh, it was extraordinary. And I didn't think I was getting an education at the time. It's only in retrospect that I realized that that stood me in very good stead in my later years. There was a lot of evacuation going on at that time. You know, all the children were being evacuated into the country, and I was too for a while. Um, uh, it's just that the air raids towards the end of the war particularly were coming so fast and furiously, particularly with the um, pilotless aircraft, the doodlebugs as we call them, um, that no housewife could get anything done and everything just ground to a halt for a while. My stepfather was very smart in that he knew he didn't have the ability to teach and because it was such a very young voice but such a sort of oddly powerful one, he knew that he had to put me in good hands if he could. And so he took me to his teacher who was a very fine a dramatic soprano, an English dramatic soprano. And she'd done a lot of um, um, 
handle and uh, and uh, I can't even think of the right word at this point. Uh, but she uh, was a very gentle woman, and I was with her for most of my early life. Only when I went to Broadway did I kind of not uh, work with her. And of course, I prepared with her to go to Broadway, but, but she didn't actually come with me. But the foundation that she gave me, uh, the uh, technique, uh, technical foundation, was terrific. Her name was Lillian Stiles Allen. Um, uh, she had an extraordinary voice and um, that wonderful kind of fluted sound that, that comes out of those extraordinary uh, dramatic sopranos. And um, she firmly believed and taught me that your voice would hold up for you if you were true to your words. And um, instilled in me this, uh, she said two or three things actually, that there could be people in the audience that needed to see what you were saying because maybe they, they were hearing impaired in some way. But more than anything, if you relied on those words, the voice would come through for you. In other words, be true to your vowels, be true to the uh, consonants that were strong, um, not in a kind of glottal way, but, but just really use them as stepping stones to a good foundation for a voice. She was absolutely right. I sang in those days a lot of sort of um, uh, opera and operetta, um, I felt that I knew, and I, I believe that I was right, that I really didn't have the voice for it. My own voice was very white, very, very thin, and, and I was able to do these incredible sort of gymnastics with it, tremendous sort of a calisthenics, but uh, in a coloratura way. And it was so high that sort of dogs for miles around would howl when I took some of the high notes on. But uh, um, she um, gave me the groundwork of, of um, opera, and she always said, go beyond your reach. If you're doing something light, practice something even more difficult. Practice it up, a tone up, so that when the night comes and you have to sing it, it is so within your range. And for many, many years I did that. My dad was um, uh, a very special human being. He had an innate decency. Uh, it didn't come from, he was very bright. Uh, he was a nature loving man. He treated all of us in the family, including his wife's other children, his first wife's other children. Uh, he treated us all the same and as beloved equals. And um, uh, we knew he was special. We, I mean, obviously, any dad to a young girl is special if, he's, if, he, if he does all the right things, and my dad certainly did. But he's the one that instilled in me any true reality in my life, because on the one side, I had this mad uh, upbringing of, of um, vaudeville and touring a great deal and very little schooling. And... Uh, um, my father was the one that took me on nature walks, took me to the swimming baths, taught me how to swim, um, uh, took me down to the seaside in freezing cold weather and we dipped in the sea and somehow uh, when we climbed the local hills and uh, um, he gave me a love of books. When I went to him, he would read to me and he would pick what he thought would be appropriate, Alice in Wonderland and things like that when I was a child. Um, but uh, he would buy books for me. I didn't see him all that much, strangely enough. Occasionally for a two-week period and a summer holiday maybe, or um, a visit over Christmas, or um, he'd come for a weekend and take me and we'd get on our bicycles and bicycle for like 15 miles in either direction to get to his place. and. Uh, um, but what he did give me was always exactly right, and, and uh, just the memory of him sitting and reading to me was uh, um, enough to make me love listening to books and the, and, and the spoken and written word. There was a book that he gave me, which it's interesting that you ask that, a book that he gave me, oh, obviously, you know, Wind in the Willows and, and, and all the classic children's books, but there was a little book that we found, and he leafed through it, and he said, here you are, darling, I think you'll like this. And it was a very small children's novel called The Little Gray Men by an English author called V.B. 
And it was a very simple nature tale of the last four gnomes left on this earth in England. It very much like Watership Down, that kind of big nature study. And it was set in four seasons. It was a terrific adventure story. I swallowed it up and um, it went out of print. And I subsequently have, have uh, started my own imprint at HarperCollins, and it's coming out this fall. I'm bringing it back again, and I'm absolutely delighted about it. It's one of our one of our mission uh, statements is to bring back books that are worthy of a revisitation in a way, and uh, this is the first one. <laughs> so it's kind of, um, and I write about it as a as a little uh, chapter before it begins. That book probably influenced me as much as anything, and my dad. Yes, absolutely, and obviously. Um, Dickens and uh, Goldsmith and, and um, um, oh gosh, so many, or, uh, Jane Austen obviously and you know, the Bronte sisters and so on. And I also loved to scribble as a kid, I loved to write my, and I, eventually I, um, because I didn't have a formal education, um, a governess was uh, found for me who traveled with me wherever I went. Um, because. Uh, touring in vaudeville, you're a week in one place, a week in another, and you could not settle into any school. So um, I had this wonderful lady who traveled with me who quickly recognized that if she wanted me to do anything, uh, all she had to do was say, do this first, and then you may write your, your story. And um, whatever story I was going to write, because that was obviously what I loved to do most of all. And um, she was a very gentle, very kind lady, and I loved her. Well, we all came from such um, humble beginnings, and my, I think what's so amazing is that, uh, and it's always staggered me, I wish I could write about it one day, I'd like to try. My mother made such a quantum leap from her extremely humble beginnings to, to being considered, certainly in our local village, fairly big time for being on radio and, um, and, and touring as she did and playing the piano so beautifully, um, and then the next leap that I made, and in, in like three generations, it's hard to, hard to imagine that it's possible, but it was, because my mother really came from, um, um, uh, her mother was just a below stairs maid at the local big mansion, and um, uh, I, I don't think in her lifetime saw any wealth of any kind and worked continuously and hard. Um, her, her father was a, um, a manager of the, one of the coal mines up in the north of England, and uh, he was a pit manager, and uh, uh, albeit a talented man and a somewhat of a poet and a musician, um, he played the piano very well also and taught my mother to play in the early years. By now I had toured England uh, fairly, well, endlessly, really, and uh, had done a lot of Christmas um, shows, which are in, in England are called pantomime, and I'm not sure how many Americans are aware that English pantomime is not pantomime or mime. It is a, a, a rip-roaring Christmas festival that of uh, usually based on all the great fairy stories, like Cinderella, like Jack and the Beanstalk, uh, Red Riding Hood, all the great fairy stories. And they put, throw music, and they throw slapstick, and, they, and, and every year they're reworked and revamped to accommodate whatever talent is brought into that particular show. And um, I had sort of gone as far as I could go and was actually playing in a very beautiful production of Cinderella at the London Palladium. And, and that was it in those days. That was about um, as far as one could go because um, although Noel Coward and Gertrude Lawrence and people like that had... Um, gone on to write and, and, and to perform in, in, in many things, other than another man called Ivan Novello. There wasn't a lot going on in England in my teens. And um, suddenly, um, I was recommended by a, a very kind woman uh, called Hattie Jakes, who appeared in one of my radio, television, uh, radio series, um, recommended that the, the director of The Boyfriend come and see me in Cinderella. The Boyfriend was a hugely popular English show that had been running in London for about a year. 
um, it was based, it was sort of a little light frothy musical, a sort of pastiche of the 1920s. And they were going to take it to Broadway with a brand new company. They weren't going to touch the original English company because they were doing too well and still selling to packed out houses. So um, uh, the director of the, of the English Boyfriend came to see me and subsequently brought the American producer. And I was asked if I would like to come to Broadway to be in The Boyfriend. It was a huge break. Uh, I didn't uh, truly recognize how big it was. Um, I was more terrified at leaving my family. I had an awful separation anxiety about leaving home because I always was leaving home and rushing back if I could at weekends. And um, uh, they were offering me a two-year contract at an incredibly small salary. And uh, there were a great many other English performers going as well because other than one or two Americans, it was, it was an English... Um, it should, that all the companies should have had English accents, and so it was necessary that they be English. I was um, 18, I was 19 the day after we opened on Broadway. And um, it's the first time I'd ever really been away from my family for that, for that potential length of time. And suddenly I got so panicked about it. And um, I called in my dad, my real dad, and I said, oh, God, Daddy, they're asking me to go for two years, what should I do, what should I do? I don't think I could be away from the family for that long. And he said, well, chick, it could run two weeks or two months, it might not be two years, and it would open up your head to such an extent, I think you should do it. I asked him later in life whether that was a hard thing to do. He said it was one of the hardest things to say, go, to just throw me into the bigger pond, so to speak, and hope that I would swim, and of course, uh, because Dad said it. Oh, he said a wonderful thing. He said, when I said, but how will I know what to do? He said, your own good brain will tell you what to do when the time comes, which was hugely flattering and kind of implied that he thought I could cope. Um, and so I took my courage in both hands and said, I would like to accept this contract, but I will not go for longer than one year. And lo and behold, uh, Messrs. Fewer and Martin said, fine. And I was the only one of the company that had a one-year contract. So off I went to Broadway for a year of incredible uh, learning and education. Well, um, the amazing thing, my life has been uh, so fortunate. I've had the most extraordinary good fortune in my life. The uh, And I, I sort of put it into three categories, the three major stepping stones, one being that opening night when I was 12, when it started my career, the second being going to Broadway, and the third going to Hollywood. And each one of those happenings happened under the most extraordinary circumstances. And what happened with the boyfriend was that because I said I would only do it for one year, just before I was going to leave to go back to my family in England, um, uh, and The Boyfriend was a huge success, and it did sort of uh, begin to um, help my career tremendously. I, I mean, I think people on Broadway certainly began to know my name a little bit. But I got a call about two weeks before I was due to leave, and it was a um, man who said, I'm the manager of um, um, uh, um, two writers called Lerner and Lowe, who are doing a new musical of uh, Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion. And um, could you just answer me one question? How much longer are you in The Boyfriend? And I said, oh, I'm going home in two weeks. <laughs> and he said, oh my, I was convinced, as was everybody else, that you have a two-year contract. And I said to the guys, well, let me make a phone call. It'll only cost a dime. And because I only signed for one year, I was able to audition for My, my Fair Lady. And by the most extraordinary good fortune, I was able to do my fair lady. And that's really when I think um, uh, my life just took off in all directions. It played havoc with me physically because three and a half years is a very long time. It was like a long tunnel. I did get a break between uh, London, England and um, America, but uh, it wasn't that long. It was a discipline, and uh, when I finished, it was like, well, now what do I do with my life? I have no life, uh, because it, it is, in a way, becoming 
a nun or just disappearing into this long tunnel. And Wednesdays always seemed very black to me. Black Wednesdays was the day that you had two shows and got up feeling awful on Thursday and had to pull yourself up only to be slammed back into the Saturday matinee again uh, because they were exhausting. And it is one of the hardest roles, my fair lady. I don't think I know um, any of the Eliza Doolittles that truly survived vocally or physically. They all, it took its toll on all of them. I met my first husband, uh, Tony Walton, uh, long before uh, uh, I became anybody. I, I'm, I had just made my, that first debut at 12 years old, and he was 13 at the time, and he came to see me in one of those English pantomimes at Christmas. It was the first pantomime I ever did, and I played the egg in Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> and uh, he was sitting there in the front row, and lo and behold, got on the train uh, going home and got off at the same station. And... Uh, said, you're from Walton, I'm from Walton. And uh, he's, uh, the Tony Walton, which is his name, is not linked with the, with the town, but uh, just happened to be similar. And uh, he said, where do you live? And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll be very um, clever. And I said, oh, the other side of the bridge. So he then went and looked up all the, uh, Wal uh, the um, Andrews that lived the other side of the bridge in this area. And lo and behold, about two days later, there was a knock on my door and he arrived with his brothers and uh, we became firm friends and eventually Tony and I married. And we have a beautiful daughter by that marriage called Emma. Met Blake in 1967. I, um, <laughs> we, we both laugh at this. I passed his car and he passed mine on um, on the cross junction, on the uh, middle island of Sunset Boulevard on Roxbury Drive. Uh, I thought, that's a very interesting looking gentleman, and I presume he must have thought the same about me in terms of being an interesting looking lady. And lo and behold, a couple of days later, it happened again and again. And finally, we were waiting for the traffic to uh, clear on either side of this intersection, and he rolled down his window, and I cannot remember which one of us said it, but it was sort of are you going to where I just came from? And we both realized that being on Roxbury Drive, we'd probably both been to see, or were going to see an analyst. And uh, I, one of us nodded, I don't know which one asked the question. And not too long after, I received a phone call uh, asking if he could talk to me about a film, uh, which was a film that we both did together called Darling Lily. It was a huge flop, and um, uh, it was great fun to make. Um, and shortly after Darling Lily, we, we were married. I think it's that early training, if anything, in vaudeville for me that, that gave me any kind of um, gumption or, uh, I mean, yeah. touring endlessly around England, doing the second show on a Saturday night in places like Glasgow or Newcastle or Liverpool or Swansea or Cardiff, that's pretty dicey. I mean, uh, there were days, and I was very, very young, there were days when they would have to turn all the house lights on in the theater because people were hurling beer bottles and, uh, and things like that. And there was this determination to get through. My mum was terrific. She would say, don't you dare complain. Don't you dare say you can't sing in cigarette smoke because in those days, everything, you could see it spiraling down the great arcs onto the uh, uh, spotlights, onto the stage. Nothing but cigarette smoke in those days. Uh, and she would, don't you dare get a swollen head. Um, accompanied by great love sometimes, but all the good stuff that one needs, get up and do it. Um, what are you complaining about? You're so much luckier than most other people. And I, that's absolutely true. You never set out to make a bad movie. You always hope that you're making a good one. Um, I think one was sad about them um, in as much as they damaged the career in any way. It's not, in those days it was important, but not as important as it is today to keep making success after success after success. It's terrifying today. I mean, uh, if you don't make, you can maybe have one so-so movie, but you've got to come back with another that's huge if possible. And that must be very, very difficult for young talent.
Yes, particularly in all the great cities, particularly in Chicago, in, in uh, New York, uh, L.A., um, San Francisco, all the really sophisticated cities. I'm not sure if it was in the Middle West. Um, its theme was provocative, but actually the underpinning of the theme was about love and being happy with who you are. Um, uh, I had a wonderful time making the film. It was Blake, my lovely Blake, at the peak of his um, creative talent, and I knew I was in the safest hands possible. Um, actually, it's a little daunting to be married to your director because quite often uh, he'll assume that I know what he wants when I'm simply begging for some uh, small morsel that will get me through. But he said, oh, oh, that's fine, just keep doing it, you know. Um, but... Uh, we could talk about it, we, and we did when, when we needed to. And uh, actually, we'd mostly uh, not talk about it when we went home. We had too many kids. We pooled all our children. He had two. I had my lovely Emma. And we subsequently adopted two. I remain optimistic, but um, not tremendously so. If I am able to sing again, it will be through some miracle operation that, that probably, I probably, there's a lot of work being done in terms of um, uh, 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 what we call the stuff, which would help um, singers regain their, their um, voices. But um, in my case, I actually lost vocal tissue, so it's very hard for my cords to rub together, and I need to replace that tissue. Um, I do have some notes in my voice, I certainly won't be able to sing the way I used to, but probably at this vast age that I have now arrived at, I couldn't sing those songs anyway. So, um, and that amazing thing of, of finding new directions at this time in my life when I never expected to. And um, uh, it was a setback, it was devastating. I miss the music unbelievably. But here I am with a publishing imprint, um, doing lectures, doing a lot of movies that don't require singing, still working as hard as ever. In fact, I think I'm maybe even more at work than I used to be. And I simply love it. I couldn't be happier. I directed um, uh, my, my Emma, um, uh, Tony's and my daughter, uh, runs with her husband and her partner, um, Sybil Burton. Uh, Sybil uh, Burton Christopher, um, a, a wonderful little not-for-profit theater in Long Island. And uh, it's, a, it's a great theater, and I directed there for them and had a ball. And, of course, it was the boyfriend in which I'd begun on Broadway and um, felt I might be able to contribute something to it and was stunned at the talent that I found and how easy and lovely it felt. And um, Tony Walton did the sets and costumes for it. I was in Emma's theater, and when I said to Emma, Emma, if I fail for the family, for you, um, what if it's not a success? What if it, she said, Mom, what better place to try than, than our theater? You're in the safest possible hands, and we'll surround you with people who know what they're doing so that you just do what you do best. And all of a sudden, it turned out to be this wonderful success. Family matters to me enormously, in fact, Family is the first priority. If my family's good, I can do anything. If they're not, I'm a basket case. And um, there's a lot of guilt associated with going out and doing um, a concert or speeches or whatever. Um, and in a way, I'm kind of glad now that I'm turning to the writing of children's books because it allows me to stay home. And although the family's grown up and they're all functioning in their own way uh, and in their own lives, there's now grandchildren and... Um, I still have Blake to go home to, and he's being very patient with me. It is America that gave me so much uh, in my life. It wasn't until I came to America that, that my life just exploded in so many ways. So for me, uh, I think in a way I've been living, even though I'm English, I've been living the American dream. And I'm eternally grateful to Americans for allowing me to do what I love doing the most. And I feel an enormous responsibility to bridge the gap between England and America and be a sort of um, 
very quiet ambassador for my country to, to, to try to sort of do a hands across the water thing where they understand England and, and uh, uh, English people understand Americans. I adore America. There's a whole new generation out there that, um, that uh, says, I remember, uh, do you remember Mary Poppins? Yeah. Sound of Music? Yeah. Princess Diaries? Oh, cool! <laughs> and I just love it.